Hi friends, Geo here. Time for the latest chapter of Speeding. Ethan is gay and in love with Pete. Pete has realized that he's bi. Pete has moved in with Ethan because he was injured in an accident and they share the only bed. Due to family problems, Pete's younger brother, Roy, has moved into their second bedroom. Pete's family is fine with Pete being bi and in a relationship, except Pete's mom. Chapter 11, Ethan. My phone rang at 6.30 this morning and I checked the caller ID, dispatch. I was still in bed, staring at the ceiling Sabretooth and Pete both asleep next to me. My ringtone, a simple wind chime. My phone was on the nightstand, and I quickly grabbed it and opened it, hoping not to disturb Pete or my dog. I knew what this meant, the call I dreaded. Chief wanted to get this over with. I answered the phone and went into the hall. Dispatch, this is Ethan, I said, trying to be calm. Sorry to call on your day off, but Chief Alvers needs to see you at 7. He says it's urgent, dispatch said. I'll be there, I said, swallowing. My stomach had become a lead ball. The call had finally come. In a little while, I'd be suspended pending a formal psychological review. I deserved it because I had failed my best friend. I couldn't save him. Tia and Braddock had to. I hung up and wandered back for Sabretooth. While Pete was in the bathroom, I took Sabretooth outside and watched the last vestiges of the silvery sunrise. Braddock was right. It's better if the story came from me directly, rather than Xavier's mouth. I hope Xavier's ready for the big leagues. But he isn't. He only started driving Sunday. Pete was in the kitchen staring at the French press coffee maker. Two questions. How do you use this, and who is calling so early? Skip the coffee. We don't have time, and the chief wants to see me right now, I said. I still couldn't bring myself to tell Pete how I had failed. I'll get dressed, Pete said. I banged on Roy's door. Up and at him. If you want a ride to the yogurt shop, be ready in 20 minutes. I grabbed a 30-second shower, enough to wake me up, and hurriedly dressed. I was about to be suspended from the job I loved. No matter what I said, or did, or how I pleaded, the chief had no choice but to ground me. Because of my fears, I had failed the man I loved. How could I expect Pete to understand? How could I expect Chief to understand? He doesn't need someone who freezes. I had enough sick leave and vacation time to survive three weeks. If they didn't clear me in that time, what would I do? What's bugging you? Pete asked. Station business, I said. When we're done there, we'll go to your apartment and pick up more stuff, and your car, and bring them back here. One box, one bag of clothes, some garbage, Pete said. Listen, about last night, I'm sorry for Mom acting like that. That's why I never want to see her again. You did invite her to our wedding, I teased. Pete shrugged. I don't know why I said that. Maybe your subconscious was trying to tell you something, big boy, I said, winking and giving my best friend the naughtiest leer I could. Pete threw a kitchen towel at me. We were kissing when Roy stepped out of the bathroom, fully dressed. He only raised his eyebrows, but didn't say anything. First stop, drop Roy off at a diner near his work so he could get some breakfast. Second stop, a drive through for me and Pete. Third stop, the end of my career. At least I'll have plenty of time to help Pete. That is, if he ever speaks to me again. By now, everyone at the station knew about my failure. Not just B-shift, but also A-shift and C-shift. You're really quiet, scary kind of quiet, Pete said as we drove to the 341. I've got a lot to think about, I said. If it's about Mom coming back, she won't, Pete said. Dad was in the parking lot telling her to leave us alone and stay away from the apartment. If he caught Mom around your place, he'd divorce her and get a restraining order keeping her away from all three of us. 
That's something I'll have to ask Lopez. Do restraining orders work like that? I asked. I don't know, but Dad would somehow arrange it, Roy said. I wasn't planning on inviting her back, I said. She wasn't a very nice guest, Pete said. What is really bothering you? I pulled into the parking lot of the 341 and backed into a space before I answered. I'm about to lose my job. What? Pete shouted. Why? I froze trying to rescue you, I said, and climbed out of the car. Pete hesitated before following me. Sea Shift was either leaving, finishing reports and then leaving, or grabbing one last cup of coffee and then leaving. A Shift was Chief's shift, and the guys were already here. My shift was tomorrow. The garage was large and had four lanes. The one closest to the main part of the building was for the ambulance. The second lane was for the paramedic truck. The third lane was the pumper truck. And the end lane was for the ladder truck. The ladder truck was currently out front where several members of A-Shift were washing it. Most of the people were congregating by the front of the pumper. Chief had called more people than me because several people from B-Shift were here. Witnesses about how I acted, no doubt. Braddock and Draper were here, but in normal clothes. Tia and Xavier were here, but in their uniforms. A new guy, about 30, black hair, brown eyes, walked towards us with a woman of the same age next to him. Dietrich was polishing the chrome of the pumper, and Steph was working on the interior. Chief wasn't here, which meant he was in his office. I swallowed. I'd be fired before my shift even started. Braddock walked up to me and gave me a quick smile. Chief called me too. Just like I expected, Xavier's been blabbing and told Chief his version. Good thing I called Chief first. He needs to hear your version. Version of what? Pete said. Pete, Tia said, walking over to my best friend and hugging him. It's good to finally meet you, and I admit, you look better than the last time I saw you. I'm Tia. Ethan's former trainer and first partner. The other guys here are Dietrich and Steph from A-Shift, our B-Shift paramedics Draper and Braddock, and the guy snarfing the cookies as the rookie, Xavier. My first partner, I asked. Chief has started moving us around. Xavier and I are on A-Shift now, she said. Are you Ethan, the new man said. He wore light khaki shorts and a green polo. I'm Lewis, and this is my wife, Mel. Everybody here tells me you're the man I have to beat, Mel said, placing her hands on her hips. She wore white shorts and a pink top. You and me, it's on, baby. Pete. This didn't make any sense. Why would Ethan get fired? Excuse me, Ethan said. I worked a rig similar to yours back in Atlanta. My wife worked dispatch, and she is a cook too. Steph bragged about how your brownies were so good they made Dietrich fat, Lewis said. I'm not fat, Dietrich yelled from the back of the pumper. Yes, you are, Steph yelled from the driver's compartment. I will prove to the 341 that not only can I keep up with their famous Ethan, but I think I can teach him a few things, too. Just wait until you taste my chocolate-dipped biscotti. The secret ingredient is rum, Mel said. I sort of told them about the cooking contest tomorrow, Tia said, wincing. None of these guys talked like Ethan was leaving. Something must have happened that they didn't know about. I remained at Ethan's side and kept quiet. Better Lewis than me. I got out of making french fries and potato salad and coffee. Only coffee snobs grind their own, Xavier said. Your trainer is a coffee snob, and you are not squirreling out on my coffee, Tia said. Not if you want to keep driving. Word of advice, Xavier. Best to stay on Tia's good side, Draper said. Amen to that, Ethan said. She prefers a dark French roast, usually with a French vanilla creamer. Somebody chuckled at the back of the pumper. Dietrich. Don't we have about two tons of potatoes in the fridge, Dietrich said. Guess what Rookie is making today. Welcome to A-Shift. Deep fryer is under the sink. At least I made the big time, Xavier said. I got promoted while Psycho Wimp is still on B-Shift. You better not let Clint hear that, or he'll come a day early just to 911 code one in the rig, Draper said. If he does that, I'm calling in sick, Tia said. 911 code one in the rig, Xavier said. 
That's what Clint calls his nasty-smelly farts and why Ethan cut back on the beans and the chili, Dietrich said, walking over to us, cleaning rag in hand. Tia, no offense, but can we swap Xavier for Ethan? I have a craving for a lemon meringue pie. Just a second, I said. Who is Psycho Wimp? The firefighters looked at each other, but Xavier spoke first. It's your boyfriend or best friend or friend with benefits or whatever is in fashion. You should have seen Psycho Wimp the other day. It was so funny. He took one step into this trashed out dump of a place we went into and went bonkers. Xavier wiggled his hands and swatted at his clothes and stomped on the ground. Ethan freaked out, had the hysterical voice and everything. Get this, he swatted imaginary bugs and almost passed out. Some guy could have died because all those boxes fell on him, and Mr. Perfect Ambulance Driver had gone all shaky and psycho. It was great. Once he's fired, do you think Chief will give me his job? That was my place. Ethan was getting fired because of me? Xavier, I'd shut your mouth if I was you, Dietrich said. Why? Everybody I've told thought it was funny, Xavier said. Tia motioned with her eyes, subtly pointing at me. Xavier didn't get the hint, so she said, Pete, meet the rookie who can't shut his mouth. Rookie, meet the man under the boxes. You live in that sh... Xavier started to say, but Dietrich elbowed him. Ethan, that wasn't you who rescued me, I asked. Ethan didn't look at me, or anybody. There must have been something really interesting on the floor, because that's all he stared at. That's why I'm going to lose my job. You called me for help, and I couldn't save you. Tia and Braddock and the guys did. I failed you. I'm sorry. The man with the perfect apartment? The man who could cook anything? The man who kept nothing? The man who saved lives every day? The man I was in love with? He froze when he saw my apartment? Ethan folded his arms and leaned away from me. He wouldn't look at me. My apartment was so bad even my best friend or boyfriend or whatever we were couldn't handle it. Something hot welled in my eyes. I called Ethan for help and now he was getting fired because my life had gotten so bad. Ethan, what's the story? A woman firefighter, I think they said her name was Steph, said, joining Dietrich and the others. Ethan didn't say anything. He had the strangest, saddest expression on his face. Steph, Ethan's grandfather was a hoarder, the kind that makes the news, Tia said. Ethan still hadn't moved. Everybody else did, making way for a man in a baseball cap that said 341, with DMB FD stitched around it. Station 341, Dead Men's Butte, Fire Department. So this is Pete. Welcome to the 341. Tia, I want to hear the story from Ethan. Xavier, keep a lookout. The 342 is stopping here on their way to Long Ridge. We have guests coming, the other man said, stepping up behind Draper. Ethan, start at the beginning. Pale, Ethan glanced at me and took a slow breath and let it out. We needed to talk, but now wasn't the place. My best friend was about to lose his job because of me. Right, Chief, Ethan said. My grandfather died two weeks before my sophomore year and high school ended. We had the funeral. All our relatives came, but Mom and my aunt didn't want to deal with the estate. That came later. Early June, Mom finally opened the front door of Grandpa's house and closed it back up again. The smell was that bad. This is going to be embarrassing for Ethan, Xavier said, smiling. Mom and Aunt Joan decided to sell the place. They invited a realtor over and he took one look and said, get it cleaned up and we'll talk. Grandpa's house was two stories tall, and it's one of the older houses in the Butte. I don't know if it was a hundred years old. Maybe it could have been. It did have a lot of bedrooms. Grandpa only used the living room and the dining room. Everything else was closed off by piles and boxes. We couldn't even get into the bathroom because it had thousands of adult diapers in it. I didn't think anything could stink that bad, but it did. It sounds sick, Steph said. Ethan nodded and sighed. Slumping a little, his eyes focused on the 341 on the side of the ambulance. Sorry, the rig. We went over every weekend, both Saturday and Sunday, and a lot of weeknights. My Aunt Joan couldn't help. 
She had breast cancer and was on chemo one week and rested the next and was almost normal the third week. Then the whole cycle started again. I learned later that her cancer had metastasized and spread into her lymph system. That's another story. I'm sorry, Dietrich said. I know a guy who had stomach cancer. Chemo is hell. Continue, Chief said. I'm an only child. It was just mom and dad and me most of the time. We spent two months clearing out part of the main floor so the real estate guy could look at it. There were cockroaches and mice and rats everywhere, especially cockroaches. Dad thought they were coming up from the drains, so he plugged the drains, but it didn't do any good. Mom thought they must have a food source nearby, but she could never find it. We had a dumpster outside that we had already dumped twice. I remember the second my life changed. Saturday, August 14th, 2.14 in the afternoon, four days before my junior year started. I can't ever forget that day. I wore an old, oversized wife beater and this old pair of loose gym shorts and flip-flops. That was the style back in Montgomery Memorial, loose and baggy. Of course I wore boxers because nobody cool wore tidy whities Xavier snickered. I'll explain why that's important in a moment. We had finally unclogged the stairs going to the second floor, and the realtor took a ten-second look and said we needed to clean it out. Grandpa hoarded papers on the second floor, newspapers, magazines, anything he thought had historical significance or things he might want to read. It got out of hand. The deeper you went into the rooms, the more the papers had rotted. It smelled like a used bookstore, but something had burned as well. There was this weird oily soy sauce kind of stink. I didn't know where it came from, but I soon learned. He had piles and piles and stacks and stacks of papers and magazines and boxes of more papers. So many boxes filled with decades old mail and old magazines and newspapers. Downstairs, we found two complete collections of the National Geographics dating back to 1888. Grandpa had more boxes than you, Pete. There were so many they made the second floor creak, and there was a ten-foot crack in the ceiling under them, and Dad thought all the weight might have cracked a beam, and he was afraid to go in that room. Stacks of papers are really heavy. Ethan didn't stare at anybody, but at nothing, as if he were still back in that house. Xavier chuckled. Draper knocked him upside the head. I remember that day. Dad and I wore the kind of rubber gloves that go past your elbows, and we wore gas masks, and we cleaned out every one of those diapers in the bathroom. The tub and sink were unusable, and the walls had gotten wet, and the drywall rotted. It took us hours to get those diapers out of there. No matter how much I washed my hands, I couldn't get the stink off me. The realtor came over and toured what we had cleaned out, which was mostly the main floor. He had some ideas about how to list the house, and he and my folks walked to the coffee shop across the street. Ethan's hand began twitching. He picked something off his shirt and brushed his arm. Xavier mimicked him. Until Tia gave the rookie the glare. At 2.14, I had the great idea of carting out the papers. I mean, they were papers. It wouldn't be hard. Papers aren't dangerous. All they can do is give you a paper cut, and I wore heavy work gloves. Papers should be easy, right? Ethan said, his voice a little higher than normal. Ethan's legs started shaking, and he brushed something that only existed in his mind off his arm. I went into the first room at the top of the stairs. Newspapers and flyers and magazines and blank papers and lots of old mail. It was hot because the papers blocked all the floor vents, and it was dusty and it was dark, and the windows were covered with dust, and the walls had mildew and mold on them. That weird smell was really strong, a really bad sour soy sauce. I thought that some takeout had rotted. There were so many papers. A lot of stacks were taller than me. Chief stared at Ethan. His face showed no emotion. Xavier hit a small half-smile, but he kept quiet. Everybody else listened. I chose a smaller stack and took the top six inches. I'd throw it in the dumpster and come back for another load. So I picked it up. I should never have done that. It was 2.14, Ethan said. Ethan brushed something off the front of his shirt, then combed his fingers through his hair, trying to get rid of something. I don't think he saw us. The papers were so old, the bottom ones had crumbled, and the cockroaches had eaten into them, and they swarmed out. They'd made a nest, a big nest. They exploded out of it. That weird soy sauce smell, that was the cockroach nest. They swarmed and exploded and ran everywhere. They covered me in seconds. 
thousands of them, millions of them, so many, all over me. I couldn't get them off me. I had to run. I stepped back, and my flip-flop caught on something. I tripped. I fell into another stack. That stack fell, and another, and another. They all fell on me. I couldn't move. The cockroaches swarmed me, crawled all over me. I was wearing loose shorts and boxers and a wife beater. They crawled everywhere, inside my clothes, in my hair, up my legs, inside my boxers, all over me. I yelled, but nobody heard me. I was alone. I tried to crawl out, but the papers had me trapped. I yelled and yelled and yelled. I couldn't move. Papers and papers and bugs. I couldn't move. Ethan's hands brushed his clothes, and he shook imaginary cockroaches out of his hair. His foot quivered and squished an imaginary bug. Tia grabbed his hand. Ethan, you're at the 341. Mom and Dad finally came back and heard me, screaming. They dug me out, but it didn't end. I kept feeling the bugs crawling all over me, and I couldn't get rid of them. I ran home and showered and used up all the hot water and the body wash, and I kept feeling them and feeling them. I burned my clothes in the frying pan. I searched our entire house for any piece of paper. Bills, family photos, books, yearbooks, mail, mom's recipe collection, whatever. Dad had stored a box of his childhood papers in my closet. I tossed it. By the time I was done, everything made of paper was gone. Cockroaches hide everywhere. My parents never noticed what I'd done until the next day, after the trash was picked up. They screamed at me. I screamed at them. They wanted me to come back to help at Grandpa's house, and I swore at them that I would never go back. I had nightmares that made me wake up screaming every night. I couldn't sleep. It was Mom and Dad's fault. They'd left me. My parents had left me. Your job is mine, psycho, Xavier said. Xavier, Chief silenced the rookie with a single stare. Buried alive on the second floor of his grandfather's house. I can't imagine, Mel said, taking her husband's hand. I didn't start school. I didn't leave my room. I kept feeling them crawling on me. Aunt Joan needed help. We didn't know it then, but she was close to the end. My parents shipped me to her house. Life became a lot different. I told you she had breast cancer. Her husband left her because he couldn't deal. I fixed meals, cleaned, and Joan would sit with me so I could get to sleep. I finally stopped having nightmares about six months later, but they come back if I get stressed. She's a saint, Braddock said. I learned a lot from my aunt. Like possessions don't matter, people do, life does. She kept a week's worth of clothes, and that's all I had brought. She didn't mind if I threw away any papers. In fact, she bought a shredder. I made sure there were no bugs in her house and no places for them to hide. My junior year in high school, I went to the high school by her house. As she got weaker, I had to do more and more around the house. Laundry, cleaning. I did the grocery shopping for both of us, drove her to chemo and all her doctor visits. I learned to cook because I had to. Sometimes, when Aunt Joan was in the middle of chemo brain, she thought I was her son even though she never had any children. During that time, I studied hoarding because I had to understand. Maybe once I did, I could accept what had happened to me. Ethan had stopped twitching and brushing imaginary bugs off his clothes. When he looked at us, he was seeing us, not his memories. March, in my junior year, I got home from school, and my aunt had collapsed on the kitchen floor. She was tired and pale and very weak. I got her to the couch and called my parents and 911 but nobody got there in time. I held her hand as she slipped away. I saw the way her eyes stopped moving, the way her chest became still. I heard her final breath. It wasn't a lingering death, but quick. It was like somebody had turned a light switch off. The last thing she said was, make me some brownies. My brownie recipe was her creation. Aunt Joan was only 46 when she died. I'm sorry, Ethan. That must have been a terrible loss. Let's switch subjects. What happened at Pete's place? Chief asked. I couldn't move or breathe or think. There was no way to escape. I don't handle small space as well, Ethan said. What happened with you after your aunt died? Dietrich asked. I packed up her things in 15 minutes and put everything from the pantry into a box. Mom and Dad picked me up and we went home. My room was just like I'd left it. So cluttered, so much stuff, so many things from when I was a kid. I was a level one or two hoarder, but never realized it. So were my parents. So's a lot of people. Joan didn't keep things around. Too much of a bother to clean, and I got used to it. 
I got a job so I didn't have to be around my parents because I was still angry at them, and I finished my junior year at Montgomery Memorial, and I met Pete my senior year. How did you get rid of all your stuff? I asked. Every time the mail came, whether I got something or not, I threw out at least one thing. My parents thought I was crazy, especially before some big test at school, and I started screaming in my sleep, Ethan said. You got rid of everything you owned? Psycho, Xavier sneered. It took a year before it was gone. That was the start of my 200 things list, and working on the rig helped me finalize my ideas. Everything had to be in its place, and only that place. Most people don't understand, but I can't handle lots of things around me. Papers or bugs, especially cockroaches. Tia, how long have you known about this? Chief asked. Ethan told me this right after that Christmas later hoarder got her arm stuck in the drain, Tia said. If there's room to walk around and we're not in there too long, Ethan's fine. He wasn't on Sunday. Sorry, Pete, but we've never experienced a hoard as bad as yours before. Chief, like I said on the phone, claustrophobic or clethrophobic, maybe both, Braddock said. Fear of tight spaces and fear of being trapped combined together. Ethan has to see a way out, otherwise he panics. I don't care about small spaces, Xavier boasted. You can judge Ethan after you've been buried alive, rookie, Dietrich said. Your thoughts, Chief, Steph said. Firefighting 101. Always make sure there is an open escape route. Not just for Ethan, but for all of us. As to the rest, I need to make a phone call, Chief said. I'm sorry, Pete. I failed you, Ethan whispered, holding his left arm. Sometime during his story, he had stepped away from me. My boyfriend only looked at the ground. I couldn't do much more than search for you, and I wasn't very good at that, Ethan whispered. So Ethan's washed up. When do I get his job, Xavier said. Didn't you start Thursday and sat on your butt half of Sunday? Somebody's getting delusions, Draper said. Two cars pulled into the parking lot, quickly followed by the rig with 342 on the side. A police car parked behind the rig. Chief, company's here, Xavier said. Tia, Ethan, Draper, and Braddock, go out and say hi. I need to make a phone call. Ethan, we're not done talking yet, so don't take off. Steph and Dietrich, go out to the cars and help, Chief said. What about me, Chief, Xavier said. Time to keep your mouth shut. Shadow Tia and learn, rookie. This is what the job is about, Chief said. Tia, Draper, and Braddock went first. I took Ethan's arctic hand and held it. He tried to give me a little smile, but the pain inside him shone through. What had Ethan said a few minutes ago? He would lose his job because my horde had freaked him out. This was my fault. Something in my gut churned. Ethan couldn't handle small spaces and was afraid of being trapped. That was my apartment. Tiny spaces. Ethan's apartment was empty because that's how he felt safe. If there was nothing around him, it couldn't collapse on him. Cockroaches didn't have a place to hide. I had to get my life together before I caused any more problems. Maybe if I talked to Chief, he would understand. He would blame me, not Ethan. Ethan had worked so hard to have this job. He lived for this job. He spent two years getting his EMT2 certificate. He loved helping people, loved driving the rig and now my problems were ruining his life. Braddock glanced back and saw us holding hands. He whispered something to Tia. She glanced back. Xavier stared at us, mouth a little open. He smiled, but not in a friendly way. I didn't care who saw us holding hands. This was my fault, and holding Ethan's hand was the only way I could tell him I was there for him. I'm not mad, I whispered to Ethan but I am sure feeling guilty. Ethan nodded. I don't think he believed me. Would I? We need to talk later, I said. Steph and Dietrich joined the two people at the cars, a guy and a girl. Both wore white shirts that said Java Dive. The four of them pulled out several trays filled with large coffee cups. The police officer went over to help them. Careful, Officer Lopez. They're hot, the guy said, and picked up a tray of coffees. The guy seemed familiar, though I couldn't remember who it was. The ambulance drivers for the 342 opened both the side door and the back door, revealing a blond man lying in a stretcher. 
Five minutes only. Then it's off to Long Ridge, one of the ambulance drivers said. Right, said a voice from the stretcher, though it was a little weak. The guys approached with the coffees, and Tia smiled. I think that woman is obsessed with coffee. Ethan pointed at the guy carrying the tray of coffees. Pete, do you remember him? He was a senior when we were juniors. That's Jared Parker from the basketball team. Which means this is our old friend, Tia said, and climbed into the rig and took the man's hand. Mitch, good to see you moving. And feeling. I've got sensations back in my legs, Mitch said. It hasn't even been a week, but they've started me with physical therapy. Thank you for giving me that chance. Hi, guys. Hope you don't mind a coffee break, but it's our way of saying thanks, Jared said, and walked to us. His voice broke, but he smiled. You saved my husband's life. I only drove, Tia said. Ethan crawled under the bus and got Mitch free so Braddock and Draper could do their stuff. Jared passed out the coffees, grinning, though his eyes were red. You're my heroes. Ethan climbed into the 342 and spoke with Mitch a minute, then climbed out, smiling. Tell me, Xavier butted in, if I went into your ambulance and looked for something, would it be in the same place as ours? Ambulance? It's the rig, or the 342. Of course it's the same, the driver for the 342 said. Tia, what are you teaching this kid? Rookie refuses to believe, and he doesn't know how to cook, Tia said. Rookie isn't going to last, the driver for the 342 said. Better start training somebody else. Once the 343 gets running, we'll be short-staffed until all the positions are filled. Xavier seemed like he wanted to say something, but shut his mouth. Time's up, the other one of the 342 drivers said. Doc Anderson is not going to be happy we stopped. I'm glad you did, Draper said. As the ambulance and Jared drove off, Chief walked up to Ethan and quietly said, Let's have words. I took hold of Ethan's hand and walked with him inside the station. The Chief looked at me, his face serious. Pete, I'm happy you're doing as well as you are, but I need to talk to Ethan, alone. Ethan's hand tightened in mine before he let it go and walked with the Chief deeper into the building. The kindest, most caring man I had ever met was about to get fired, and it was my fault. Thanks, friends, for sharing Chapter 11 with me. For what it's worth, Ethan's incident with the papers and cockroaches is based on a real incident. Me and a friend, I'll call Dave, found a fun place to rent. It was a little old coffee shop or sandwich shop converted into a studio apartment. Big room up front, kitchen in the back, and behind that was a small utility corridor that had the bathroom, water heater, and a shower. There wasn't room for a bathtub. The landlords were an older couple that wanted a little extra income, and they would rent it to us with a discount. The previous renters had snuck out and were disorganized hoarders, I'd say a level three, and the old couple wanted us to clean it up. That's why there was a discount. Another friend, let's call him Alex, was having roommate troubles at the time and needed a place to stay. This new place had the room once we got it cleaned out. This place stunk of old takeout. In the space that divided the kitchen from the big room was a five-foot stack of papers and magazines, surrounded by smaller stacks. First day, we all took off work and shoved as much of the mess into trash cans as we could. A local store had a big dumpster, and we probably should have asked, but we dumped stuff there too. That night, the garbage truck came and gave us room to dump more stuff. That first day, we made great progress, even discovering a bed, which we threw out, and an old couch, also thrown out, plus a wooden table and some chairs. We kept those. About halfway on the second day, we had finally gotten back to the stack of papers and magazines. I think you can guess what happened. Dave and I were trying to maneuver the mattress outside while Alex was going to take some of the papers and magazines to the trash. That stack of papers and magazines was a cockroach nest. Big one, too. The first we knew there was a problem was when Alex screamed. I looked over and thought a jar of rotten strawberry jam had exploded. Alex was covered in wriggly brown stuff. I learned a few seconds later that it wasn't jam. 
Alex ran out of the apartment screaming, in the process knocking the stacks over. Dave and I ran over to figure out what happened. That's when we realized the size of the cockroach nest. I couldn't believe how big cockroaches got either. We joined Alex outside. Alex was stripping and shaking his clothes out and stamping on the ground. It had freaked him out. He wouldn't go back inside until after Dave and I cleared out the magazines and papers. Funny thing, we were outside with Alex for 30 minutes or more, but when Dave and I came back in, the cockroaches had vanished. That's why we threw the old bed out and the old couch. We didn't know what was inside the fabric, and we didn't want to find out. We stayed there about six months, until the old man passed away and the wife sold the property. The incident in this chapter was based on this situation. I only tweaked it a little bit. Thanks for joining me. Remember to do something today to make you feel special. You're worth it. Peace.